In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and my God, I pray your hand, Jesus, not to be removed from my head, not to be removed from my life. And I also pray that, Father God, when you visit me, all that are important and necessary for my life will find me. Cause them to locate me, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, refresh my soul. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that, Lord, this day, Father, you will remember me. And Father, revisit my life and remember, Lord, and turn my captivity in the mighty name of Jesus Christ so that, Lord, I may walk in your fullness that it be well for me. Somebody shout a big amen. Um, my name is Lufuno Nemavola. Uh, I was born in Nyanzi in the area of Achua, Savenda, Bembe district. Um, born to one master, Nemavola Muchuchu Tinson. I don't even know what that meant. And, uh, and my mom was Chikiwa Dorcas Nemavola, of which they are both late. And uh, I think what got me to this chair is, is my journey from my birth um, school and today I'm, I woke up, I'm a bishop and, uh, and I'm sitting here as a bishop. Do you maybe just want to take us through the first five years of your life? How, was that? How did that go? Wow, that was an interesting journey and um, of course I don't remember when, when I was conceived but my mom told me a lot of what happened. Um, apparently, actually I am born in a, in a royal family and a big family. My, my, my dad was a polygamous man according to the culture, the vendor culture at the time and well, according to our culture, Two women are not supposed to, to be pregnant at the same time. And that was my story when I was conceived. Um, my mom was a second wife, and apparently she fell pregnant, I think a month later after the first wife fell, fell pregnant. And the family had to come together and say, no, according to the culture, it's not supposed to be so. And um, the solution seemingly was that the one who falls pregnant after must abort. Um, I don't know what measures they were trying to use then, but what my mom remember, told me, I remember her telling me that I had to uh, fight and resist and refuse and guess by that time she was only 18 years old. And she had to fight the whole big family of which they had to subject her to heavy duties, like cooking for the whole family, going to the mountain to get firewood so that you know with this excess work well, she will uh, abort naturally like uh, we had a field most of our uh, or rather let me say my family my dad was able to take care of his family or he rose to where he 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 passed on being through you know cultivating the land and so then she will have to work the field until very very late at night or they didn't, you know, uh, naturally abort me, as you can see, I'm still here. Um, actually, when she was pregnant, of course, going through all the, the challenges that she went through until the time when she had to deliver. And of course, she had to go and wait at the, at the well, well, it was a clinic in Zimauri. It was a Zimauri clinic, um, the old one, where she must wait and... Um, Unfortunately, back then, there was no one that would you know, like serve her food. She must depend on her family to bring her food, of which because I was an unwanted child, no one will come. And she told me that there was a lady that was with her in, the whole, in, the, in that clinic, 
that her family would bring her food and amongst what they would bring was a banana so then uh, the lady would give my mom one banana a day until that what she, she lived on and other of, of course i also lived on that one banana a day until the day that we were, I was supposed to be delivered i was born on a sunday um, so the nurses that were supposed to help her realize that it is taking long and they have other commitments outside of work apparently they left her um, said they will see her when they come back and she was just left alone in the whole clinic and then I came up back I, I, my mom told me that I was born around 12 on a Sunday uh, hence I must preach around 12 on a Sunday um, so I, I, I came around and she was alone so she had to push and and make sure that she give birth to a healthy baby but she had prayed before going to the hospital she said because of all her suffering um, her suffering not only meaning that what she went through because of me but the fact that her mother left her when she was only three months old and um, she doesn't know the face of her mother she never saw her photo she doesn't even know what happened to her mother so she grew up uh, with her brothers which they, my my grandfather her father was living in the city apparently he was he had another family there so they had to fend for themselves from the age of three months carried by her brothers from house to house looking for food place to sleep so until she got married into a big family of which of course also turned out to be painful than she expected she thought she was gonna find rest if she because she said the reason why she chose to marry a grown man married man was because she thought boys would play with her and she suffered enough so, so she believed that if she was to face uh, and, and be married to an elderly man who knows what he wants and what he's doing he will be a better uh, father to her in it in essence and uh, and unfortunately she will be married to a big family not just one man and that caused so much pain so she her prayer was that if God can bless her with a son that can be a father to her children then she said she promised God that she will give him to God to save God for the rest of his life just like Hannah in the Bible and then she said she asked God that if this boy will be born if he is truly from God he must have a mark a dark mark in the middle of his chest so that she can believe that this is a gift from God and that Sunday afternoon when she gave birth alone she said she didn't care about the umbilical cord and everything else she first of all she wanted to see if the mark was there and when she saw the mark she said she had so much peace that she didn't care about anybody and everything she just held her baby until the nurses came back after one to that of which that's when they were shocked to see that she actually gave birth alone and they wash the baby and then of course cut the umbilical cord and stuff like that and that's when my aunt came she came um, to to see on my mom but unfortunately there was no clothes there's nothing because the child was not expected in the house uh, fortunate enough my mom was good with her hands she had sewn a jersey for my sister that came before me so it, it was that jersey that i had to wear from the hospital going home in the next four years of my life wearing that one jersey and she said funny enough i never had flu i never suffered i was a happy child I'm just interested, have you ever sat with your, with your father to ask where were you when all of this was happening to your mother? Well, my father was a traditional man. He, he was not a kind of, those who knew my father, were, it's not a man you will sit down with him and ask those kind of questions. He was a very traditional man, number one, and he was a very hard man. Uh, of course, and I understood, he grew up as the only son of his mother. Um, as he was growing up so he didn't have an elder brother to defend him or anything so he had to fight him his way through life and that made him very very hard and harsh so growing up he, he was difficult he was one person that no one will actually sit down with him and ask him 
he will call them stupid questions and then of course you will get the the back his backhand So just to understand, I guess, the um, dynamic of your family, your father was a very traditional man, and I think traditional men are very, you don't ask questions that are beyond your age to an elderly person. What about your aunts? What about everybody else in the family? Your your stepmother, if I may, because you just say that your father was a good man. What was everybody saying? When you ever ask anyone in the family, where were you when that was happening to my mother? Well, I was born in times where questions were taboo in the family. You don't question anything. Unless if you are tired of living in that family, then you, you must just leave. You don't question. So there was no way anyone could ask. I only asked my mother uh, when I became a teenager, looking into my relationship with my father. It was very harsh and difficult. We will not cling together. Of course, it was the same with others. Um, but I felt like he was more harsh on me than any of my siblings. And I began to believe that maybe he doesn't like me, maybe because he's not my father. And I started asking questions. Why does he hate me this much? Why does he treat me this harshly? And that's when um, I think a few months just before my mom passed, she was willing to open up and tell me everything, like how I was conceived and what happened to me as I was after I was born, those years growing up. Um, and why was it that my dad was very harsh towards me? Yeah, because um, other than the issue that you know these two two children cannot be born of the same age from different women at the same time. Um, of course, like any other man that will face challenges of pressure of the family and obviously beginning to believe he himself that I was not his child. So as, as a result, he had that resentment towards me that I that caused a lot of you know rejection and um, sometimes I, I will recall times when treatment was very different from others and um, sometimes when others would get gifts, things, clothes, sometimes I will be left out. And I didn't understand that. What I was told or what he, I, I remember him saying was because my uncles will come with things, because my uncles will bring me shoes, bring me, you know, secondhand clothes from their children. So I thought that was the only reason because he will say every time my uncle give me something, then he must buy things for his other kids. And then I'll be left out because I got second-hand stuff from, from my uncles. So I believe that it's because of that, that maybe my uncles love me, that maybe he, he feels he, need to, he needed to share that love for others. They shouldn't feel left out. I don't know. But it was, it was a different era at the time. You, cannot, you couldn't ask a lot of questions except for that's why I believe my mom didn't want to tell me anything. She didn't want to get into trouble. Um, and I've now, I'm, I'm now only left with the thought that maybe she told me somehow she could feel that she was going to pass and she just have to answer a lot of questions that I had because I had a lot of questions growing up because of how things were for me and around me and I didn't understand and my relationship with God, because I just grew up with being that, that child that just loved the Bible more than any other book. I remember in, in primary, I will pass uh, biblical studies higher than others I can even fail. Even when they say, go and do this homework, I'll be reading my Bible. And I grew up like that. I, the stories that I grew up you know, with in my head were the stories of Daniel, the stories of David. As a child, I'll spend a lot of time reading by in my Bible from the lower primary. So I didn't understand why why is it that I love the Bible this much and not other subjects? 
I thought maybe I was just lazy to study, but I was just drawn to that. Now I believe. Well, around the age of two to five uh, will be difficult for any child to remember things. But I have this one vivid memory. And uh, I've always thought I was five years old because I could, I mean, I couldn't fathom the idea of being younger than that. Why would I have a memory of that when I was younger? Until my brother, our elder brother in the family, um, told me that I was actually three, I think, two or three years around that. When one day, um, remember my family is a royal family. It's, you know, uh, we are traditional people. And one day I was, I remember standing outside the gate with my brother, the one that we uh, born the same time. I think with others, the, the, the elder, the other brothers and sisters that were older than us, they were outside the gate. And my, our elder brothers were, you know, releasing the cows from the crawl, you know, taking them to the pasture. And others were able to run away. And my brother were able to also to be snatched from the street. And I'm just standing there, you know, as a child, you're just innocent looking at these things. And, you know, these cows were coming out. We had one cow that uh, we used to, it used to be called Madari. I don't even know what that meant and why my grandfather named it that. But it was the leader of all the cows in the family. And it had serious significance in the family that I will not get in, into since I never asked about that from my, from the source. But when it came, when they came out, it, that cow was leading. It was a female cow. It was leading the rest of the, the flock. It came to the gate, and that's when people noticed that I'm left alone there. And, but it was too late. The cow was already there. So it came. I remember its horns. It brought, brought its horn to my feet and opened my legs. And I was holding on to it. And then it put me down, lifted me up and put me down. And my brother said, um, it, it, it kind of nailed, it nailed before me, sort of. I don't know. And that shook everybody, even my grandfather, even my father was shocked. Like, why would that cow behave that way towards me? And from my, my brother, from what my brother said was, from that moment, they started having, you know, watching carefully my life for me. Who, who is this child? What is he to this family? And uh, yeah, of course, like every kid, I, I started school, I started primary at Mianzi, primary school. And then high school, we, I went to uh, Runangwe. And then I only did uh, standard six, that's grade eight, I guess. And then from there I moved. That's when I moved from Mianzi, where I was born. Because um, my dad, because of work, um, had to have another house in, in, in where we are today, Mutare uh, Chalamba. So my mom was working at the time for my dad in the, the driving school and then moved to to his um, fruit shop and so since they couldn't do the traveling all the time because like my mom left me to work when I was three months old um, so I never actually get that mother child you know, that love and bond I never knew to call her mom all my life because uh, I've grew up knowing people calling her by her first name and that's how I, I, I knew her so, so I, we, we never actually stayed together in that sense of a family until when I did my, my when, when, after my grade eight and I moved to Todani Highs, when I, that, that is now in Chiramba. And that's when, the, that's was the first time we actually come together as a family, including my sisters on my mother's mm -hmm. side. Yeah, I did, um, I did my metric. Oh yes, and I failed. Primary, <laughs> I failed. Uh, that is standard three. I don't know what grade that is. Standard three, and then my brother went ahead, and I was left behind. So I will always been chasing after him. Um, and um, 
So when I went to uh, Totani, um, well, still I was being haunted by the Bible. The Bible was still number one. Everything else comes last. And, and that meant now I'm learning that there is, you know, what you call SCM. Uh, we uh, became part of that. In that school, they will allow students to to have uh, their own devotions on during certain days of the week. So I'll be preaching from class to class. Sometimes I'm preaching in grade 12 while well, I'm still down there, you know. And uh, I guess that's where my ministry started, where I actually get comfortable in front of people. Because growing up, I was, I was they, they said I was a very shy child. But I believe I was not that shy. I was just, it was just the experience of rejection that made me reserved myself because everything that will go wrong as I was growing up was my fault. Even when I'm not there, I'm, I must be accountable. So it caused me to like be quiet so much and people believe that I was a shy child. But then I had to, with, with the SEM, I had to learn to, to stand in front of people and preach. And by then, we were fellowshipping at uh, Faith Mission um, at the time uh, under Pastor Manyapie from Chisauro. And um, so I, I got involved with the youth movements in the church, and youth movements in the, in, at school. I got used to speaking to people in public. And, you know, sometimes, you know, that's when I got myself involved in speech and debates because that was the second thing I loved other than biblical studies or subjects. So, and apparently in my school, I was doing better. So I don't know if the school just didn't have people that were more ambitious to do that or I was that good. I don't know. And now going out into um, competing with other schools around of which I'll come back with the certificates being number one at times. Because that was just a preparation towards uh, Ministry and public life. Why would you tell Drago Gugubara, Gugubara, Zangazunemutua, yeah, my primary and high school life, in a nutshell, but nothing really much happened except that I got born again when I was doing grade trial, grade, grade eight. These great things still confuse me. It started at six. Um, there was a conference in our church. I was staying with my brother, and then we went for the conference, and the pastor that was preaching talked about. Uh, people that will give their lives for the service of the of the ministry, give themselves to serve the church. And so, if any if there's anybody that feels like you are done just sitting and you want to do something for your church, come forward. And I stood forward, and that was the day I, he he said that we should pray a Lord's prayer, of which I did. I received Christ that day, and then the following year, it was December and January we were moving. So when I got went to the new area, since I've, I've given myself to self, I became the Sunday school teacher. And um, from there, I was just growing in service into the youth programs at school, at church, Sunday school teacher on Sunday morning. And um, wow, I, I, I miss those days. They, those were my happy days, you know, just spending time with kids. So if we were to ask anyone that went to primary school or high school with you, what do you think would be their response? What would they say about you? Primary, they will be shocked because they know me to be this quiet person that's very shy. And I, I think, actually, not just those who went with, to school with me, even people from my area, because they knew me, that, that this, this quiet child that has nothing with anybody, no fights with anybody, just calm and quiet and peaceful person. Uh, a Kaiser Chiefs fan, and uh, so they will be shocked. They will be really, really, really shocked uh, that I, I can, I, I am the person. Actually, 
they are shocked and because i've heard others even say that to my face that how did this happen because you are this person that doesn't talk and that's shy how do you even stand in front and preach <laughs> And uh, <laughs> I don't know God's doing, I guess. As a boy child, there's a stage where almost every boy, quoting now, every uh, boy child has to go through or goes through. There's alcohol, there's girls, there's sneaking out of the house, there's stealing, like, you name all these vast things. How was your life when you came to those things? <laughs> That's very funny because it brings a lot of crazy and funny moments. Yes, well, I, I, I grew up with other kids and, and other boys and we, we did boy stuff, like fighting, uh, even though that was my, not my thing. But our elder brothers and, and bigger brothers in the area will force it. It's either they beat you or you, you fight. So. And the, another thing was smoking. There was a number thing, number two thing that every kid or boy of my age at the time were forced into that. And uh, we used to smoke, uh, what's that, that tree? Chifuraturo. Chifuraturo, some, some tree. It, it, it's got a, uh, sort of a mintish smell. And uh, yeah, they would call, force us to sm smoke that or popo leaves, you know, of which I'll cough and feel like I was going to die. So that was not for me. And well, my dad, God rest his soul, when before he was serious in the things of God, well, he, he used to drink. So he would buy Hunter's Dry, a case and case of them for, for his kids so that he can enjoy with his kids. And apparently, since I was a kid, because my dad was drinking since then, uh, others will be given and they will take. But when it comes to me, they started calling me a pastor then from the age of five, because I would say, no, I will refuse to drink that. So with that, now that I'm grown, it's puberty, and then others are drinking. Um, I, I, I also started drinking that, um, but even though those who drink, they will tell you that, you know, Hunter's Dry is not bad. It tastes, it is sweeter than other bitter stuff, but still it wasn't my thing. And uh, I didn't go far with it. I don't think I lasted months with it. I was like, I oh, know, that's not me. And, and that was not because maybe a church would be taught something. No, it was just not me. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And so, yeah, I have, well, that, that's the early stage of, of puberty where you are naughty as kids. And, but then the, the third stage will be girls. Uh, that was just not me from the start, the way it go. Um, my start at sixth grade eight, not me. And then of course, my mom played a big role now when I was in high school because she will keep preaching to me, like, Rufono, your wife is not born yet. So stop it. Don't even look. She will preach that every day, every day. And she, yo, and if a girl will walk me from school when she saw or heard, she will go after that girl and tell her the story of her life. So she just always alienated me from any girl. And so she didn't give me a chance. To, to even be naughty in that way. And I threw out my high school until, well, when I, when I was doing my high school, so we were, cause she used to give me that mark to say, you know, when, if you can do your high school, like your, your metric, then ah, no, it's fine. You can, you can have a girlfriend. So when I was writing, I, I was now in that push in that age, like, no, I need a girlfriend. And of course, among 
us as, as you know as boys growing up we always had that thing that once you go to tertiary you get confused you will not know who to marry so you must make sure you mark your one before you you finish your high school so when you get out there you've got your your, your woman ready and unfortunately my mom didn't give me a chance so i didn't have my woman i was trying and i i, I met a girl when i was doing my when i was writing my final exam and she said yes i don't even know how i started because i was very shy but for some reason she understood my language i don't know if i was i was using sign language to try and make her understand like okay me like you me me want to be me uh, something like that i don't know but eventually i was like okay i have a girlfriend now what i didn't know what was the next step i have a girlfriend and what do i say next because he said yes yo yeah th those were hard days and uh, funny enough i was i was i was going to tertiary immediately after that january i was psh, off to to rema bible college so uh, after being taught a word more than i've been taught at church i realized uh, this relationship is not time yet so i had to dive in dodge because i was like i don't even know what to do with her I mean, you have a girlfriend what do you do with a girlfriend let me just focus on God. I know I pray to him. Then when it comes to girlfriends, ah, I don't want to be talked negatively. Like, ah, that one, crash you. I doesn't even know what to do. He doesn't even touch me. So let me leave girlfriends alone. And I focused on God. That was my, my high school, my primary and high school life. And uh, naughty life, well, yes. You know, growing up with other boys, you'll be naughty, passing somewhere, and then you encourage each other to just throw stones on people's windows. I did that, and I'm not going to say where, so that they don't come after me now, because I guess they never knew who did that. And I didn't mean to, to do it. They made me do it. So God, God forgave me a long time ago. So yeah. And around that time, um of course my dad also was running a driving school so it's was almost like mandatory for all of us to, to be able to drive and i remember i was i think i was 15 i think i was around 15 16. um i was driving from church rushing to my dad's shops to get some cold drinks because there was a function at church um and um yeah, I was still going almost to the shop. That's when I had an accident. I was just a kid. I didn't have a license. My very, very first accident in my life where uh, my dad's 4 by 4 went in between two electric poles that was carrying a transformer, a lower transformer. So the transformer cut through the hood of the car to, to, the, to the steering wheel, which means it, it was just like sitting right in front of me and uh, that's where we saw God's grace for the first time in my life experiencing it because those who witnessed what happened when the when the car touched the first pole electricity went off the whole area and I think it was the very same day that in the other place next to the clinic that I was born Another gentleman hit a pole without a transformer and wires touched them each other and then the fire came down into the car and he, he died in the fire. And here I am hitting a transformer itself, carrying all that written kaifar like ingos, danger. And then God's grace just took me out. And as soon as I came out of the car, apparently I came out myself and collapsed on the floor. And then when I collapsed, electricity came back in. And then nobody could touch the car for that time. And uh, I was, of course, carried to the hospital. Check, nothing was broken. I was okay. And I came back to, to school and proceeded with life. I saw God. So when you were in your puberty stages, right, what kept you going? Other people would be like, I wanted better for myself out of this life, so I had to be focused on studies. Other people would be like, no, my parents made me. You know, other people were like, no, I was a church person. I had to carry myself this way. What What did you see yourself as when you were that age that kept you going? If I um, what kept me from 
many things or many destructive things that have destroyed many other young people like me or of my age from my time. Number one was, I think, the grace itself, the grace of God. And But number two, because of where I was born and what I've been witnessing growing up in my family and watching my mother, I've always wanted to, to be a better person. I've always told myself, I'm going to grow up and do better so that I can take care of my mom. And of course, my mother, and on top of that, making it difficult for me <laughs> to even be anything or, or naughty because I did have friends that will pull me into what they were into. But whenever I feel like doing what they're doing, my mom will be on my case. She can tell. I don't know how, but she could just tell. Her. This one came back with the devil today. And then she will come to my room. If I refuse to sit with her, she'll be knocking at my door until I open. And she start preaching everything that I got inside of me to preach it out of me. So I had no choice. God will not let me. My mother will not let me. And also I had desires to see my mother in a better space. And, and I wanted her to be proud of me. And the other thing was, I remember watching those those stories. I, I don't know if it was or something like that or all the time. Um, there was this guy, I uh, can't remember the role, but I remember the words that he said in the story because he was playing a role of this suffering person that he was persecuted all the time. He was coming from disadvantaged family. And he said, success is the best revenge. And I held that since then in my heart that after all, of, of all things that I'm going through and I just want to be successful. And for people that are saying I'll amount to nothing, because I've been told that many times, that I want to be successful. I don't want to be a drunkard. I don't want to destroy myself. I don't want to enjoy what other young people are calling fun. I just want to be successful so that I can pay the good revenge, a sweet one, to them that expected worse out of me. You mentioned that when you were growing up, your father or your family never to you any clothing. Did that change when you became a little bit older in your high school, primary school, high school years, or did that remain the same? Well, not necessarily that they didn't get me clothing. They, they would at times, but only when I get something from my mother's side, that's when others will get and I wouldn't. But they will get us clothing. Um, because if there was one thing my dad was not, was a person that was negligent of his family. He make sure there's food, he make sure there's clothing. That he will fight by all means that we also always have that. So, but you know, growing up, of course, because my dad had a big family, you should understand the pressure he had. He was not a millionaire. He, he, he had his businesses, but to take care of such a huge family, it takes a lot of money. So at, at, at and from high school, then we came to an age where he said, no, now that you guys are old, uh, let, me, let me worry about the little ones. And then, then he stopped. And um, it was tough going to school. I remember teachers would beat me for not tucking in my shirts. Um, but the thing was, I couldn't tuck them in because my pants were just holes in the back. So I, there was no way I, the other kids were going to laugh at me. So it was that it was bad. I wouldn't have shoes to go to school, and uh, friends will, you know, I'll borrow shoes from friends and uh, and be able to. I remember I used to wear this four corner shoe. It was weird. I, I that was the only shoe I've seen in the whole world till today. It was very ugly, and the friend that had it was wearing it for fun. But I had to wear it so that I could be able to go to school. And uh, people got used to me like that. And they thought I was just this funny person because they know my family, they own businesses right there next to the school. So they wouldn't believe that I wouldn't, definitely wouldn't have shoes to go to school, but I didn't. And, um, and even the pants that I'm talking of, uh, I, you know, pants that some I'll get from friends because I didn't have a uniform. And, uh, 
and and of course teachers will keep beating me because they didn't there was no way they would believe that this man who has these businesses like that and who seems to be he is he's one of the the, the pioneers of, of of development in our area when it comes to business so fact that he couldn't struggle buying shoes for his son it's not just not possible so it it will cost my mom to like whenever because our dad will buy us clothes every december once a year so instead of getting casual clothes even even though i wanted that to look nice on christmas my mom will buy uniform on christmas so i'll have to wear uniform on my on christmas uh, so that the rest of the year i'll have something to wear to school that was before my dad will like hey now i can't i can't take it you guys are grown now let me take care of the younger ones so it became a challenge um but god always make a plan you know and of course you will know the, the, this there are this best boutique village boutique where they will you know just you find your clothes you know laying on the floor nicely with these nice sweet ladies that sell those clothes although they will not be ironed but i understand they were hiding the beauty of the clothes so the owners of the clothes will be able to find them so that's where we mom my mom and i will find my clothes you know you, you get pants for five friends you get shirts for 10 rands we'll be like wow this handsome guy wearing nicely so expensive and worst of all those clothes were coming overseas so i was better than people wearing from dance and other clothing that were made in south africa so i was expensive hidden behind the clothes that are not iron but the boutique they were not so expensive because they don't have to pay rent so they use god's god's uh, stores it was a nice open mall so when my mom would go there and just you know, she would be selling tomatoes and bananas on the streets and She'll come back with two pens for 20 rands. Guess what? Best. <laughs> what God related things happen from primary school until high school that you witnessed outside of your families um, explaining it to you? Well, of course, um, I mean, you will see God every day in your life. Um, but the biggest miracle for me that I would be the grace of growing up that 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 is a miracle co considering where i'm coming from and my background my family and but the one thing that that really just left me you know with you know that 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 desire for more to understand because obviously when i go to church you hear people preach and teach but you didn't understand how well, but I want to, this to be personal. Um, there is there's something that used to happen when I was a kid, since I was, I was very little. Apparently, even the neighbors had noticed that there's something different about me. Um, the, what, the, what I remember vividly is one of the, the elderly ladies in our, around our home uh, that will come whenever she plows uh, you know summertime when she's whether it's uh beans it's it's uh, corn whatever she's planting she will carry the hand hoe and and you know dig the ground and give me the seed and say please you be the one to put down because apparently whatever i plant yo it will grow and if it's if it's a milli uh, plant it will have like three or four corns and I remember at home, I, I used to like gardening. Yo, I loved, I loved that. And that made me love a little bit of agriculture. I remember I used to have my little garden. To me, it was big, but it was, it was, it was very, very small. Now when I think about it, it was very small. I'll plant everything in that one space. I remember I planted two mango trees and that thing was not as, it was not bigger than a couch. And I was able to plant two mango trees. I'll plant my millicons. I'll plant um, uh, what you call the butternut. Uh, yeah, because we have those that other type that we as vendors we eat the leaves, uh, making puri and and mabobo or stuff. And that one when I plant because it grows, so it 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 took so much space. 
almost <laughs> the other wing of the whole stand. And people will think that it's many of them, while it was just one. Um, you know, I would plant everything. It, everything would just grow. But because I was young and I was very small, so when I cultivate that small piece, to me, it, I have cultivated the, you know, the whole orchard. And uh, so, so those are some of the things that made people realize you know, this it's just certain grace that is upon this young child. And, and, uh, and, and of course, survived a lot of things. I remember, you know, being naughty as kids, we would go to the rivers, River Mutare, to swim. We once went into this lake where there were crocodiles. And um, that time I was following the, our elders and I didn't know how it was deep down there. When I got there, since I was learning to swim, only to realize there is a rock at, at, the, at the floor of the, 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 the lake. But it was, it was steep and it was very slippery. slippery. So, I, you know, you will swim a little bit and you want to stand. And only to realize that when I try to stand, I'm standing on the steep slope. So the water, since the, the river is flowing, it will push me deeper into the, the deep end. And um, <laughs> growing up, I'm reading the Bible, obviously, there's one person that could save me. Because now I could feel that now I'm drowning. And uh, I have to call Jesus. As a kid, I, was, I didn't know and understand anything about being born again. And um, for some reason, I'll just find myself on the other side. I'm coming, getting out, and I don't even know how I survived that. But by God's grace, and then most of all, it's just that regardless of the challenges, I, and, and the fact that people consider me as a shy, quiet person, I enjoyed my childhood. I had, I had so much fun. And, um, well, I, 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 one thing that I'm not, or that I didn't really enjoy much, it's uh, sports. When we were kids, we would play soccer without shoes. And that's when, I, I, like I said, I, I've been a Kaiser Chiefs fan ever since I knew soccer, so till today. But my love for soccer had to like diminish a little because one time when we were playing, uh, our, our soccer ball uh, was damaged. We, I think I remember we were playing a match with another village and then we had to finish the match with uh, a tennis ball because the, the, our ball, we couldn't use it anymore. And when I was trying to kick and I missed the, the tennis and I went into uh, <laughs> this thick grass and uh, yeah, my big toe looked the other direction. It hurt so bad and I got home and my mom was so mad at me and she like, I told you about this soccer thing of yours. And uh, yeah. Till today, I've not healed properly. I can't walk a long distance without that pain coming back. So it, whenever it comes back, it reminds me not to watch soccer. So I, I <laughs> yeah, that, that's so much one can, can share about my childhood. Oh yes, and um, you know, having moved to, 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 the, to this new area, uh, Chilamba, and then joining the Faith Mission Church there, I began to grow in the things of God. You know, I had to learn to go fast and also to pray in the mountains. Until this one time, I think I was grade 12 or so, um, I had to be on my own, but then I was not going to go to that mountain by myself. This other time, you know, other, other brothers, you know, will look, you know, like guys will say, okay, this weekend, Friday, we're going to the mountain, we'll come back Sunday morning. And this time, I wanted to spend the whole week in prayer alone. And I had to go to my dad's uh, business, the driving school. So we had rooms where people that come from far when they were doing driving school, they can lodge in there. And I closed myself in there, of which my parents were very, were very opposing that because they knew my condition. I was born with a, with a very, very diff difficult and rare disease. Um, my stomach was not okay since I was a kid. I grew up um, in the hospitals, in and out of hospitals. So that also developed and create uh, ulcers on top of that. 
So I, I wasn't supposed to fast. I wasn't supposed to stay long without eating. But that time I, I realized, no, God has a calling on my life. Because by then I've been prophesied several times by different pastors. And, um, and even some of the guys in our church will speak that with my dad. That no, There is a call of God upon his life. Please encourage him. So though they didn't approve, but they couldn't stop me. And I was very stubborn when it comes to the things of God. I didn't care about my, my condition. And I closed myself in the first day, the second day, the third day. I think it was on the fourth day. I was sleeping one night. And I've been praying. I'm, or you, you understand I'm tired and I'm hungry. And I was sleeping. And I heard, as I was sleeping, I heard people singing. And I'm sleeping there, and I that and that I joined them while I was sleeping, and I'm singing with them, and they're singing, they're singing, and I and, and it came to mind that I can't be sleeping when others are busy praying and worshiping God. And it didn't click to me that I'm alone. And I woke up and they're still singing. And I could see there are people here. And as I'm singing with them, we are singing, we are worshiping God. That's when it dawned to me, now these are angels and they disappear. And those voices went quiet and I was left singing alone. That was around 11, 12 at night. And um, I continued praying and that gave me so much strength to pray. I, I remember I came back home Friday night. I was happy, like, oh God, I was not alone. Even though I got sick when I got home because I didn't know how to, to handle that. Cause I'll just, since I'm, I'm hungry, I just got home and just eat my pap and, and then it damaged my stomach. But well, I got well as along the way. And I kept on praying, I kept on fasting and that, until God healed me miraculously. Um, then when I was there in high school, I remember there was uh, this doctor, a white doctor from Pretoria. His name was Dr. Charles. Uh, he was, he was, he was, he just finished his medicine and he started practice in Chirama. So when I, Went to him, I was really, I was taken to him because I was very, very sick because of ulcers. I've been in and out of hospitals and it was not helping. And um, when he checked me, he said, no, your condition is worse. I guess because of this fasting, um, I was eating off my stomach lining and my intestine was so damaged that they were about to tear and it could show on the, on the sauna. And he said, no, the only solution is for us to operate. We have to cut your intestine where they are damaged and then and put them together, and, you know. And I asked if I would be okay after that. I'll be perfectly normal and never suffer. He said, no, intestines are not like your flesh. They don't heal. You will, be, you will, be very, you will have to be very careful what you eat and how you eat. And there can always be dangers of them tearing and then that might even cause you death. So I was like, nope, I'm not doing something that dangerous. Then he, he said to me, you look like someone who, who knows God. I said, yes. Then he started writing scriptures for me since then and saying, I want you to read these scriptures. Every time he will tell me to come back in two weeks time. My parents will think that when I'm going back, I'm going back for, for medication. And you know, it was, it was for, for the scripture reading. So I'll meditate on the scripture the whole two weeks. And after that, when I go back and say, recite it to me, I'll recite the scripture. And they were all about healing, that by his stripes I'm healed. And um, so I'll recite that back to him until finally, when we finished that course, he said, let me check you. And he checked me. There were no wounds. My intestines were restored. And uh, yeah. My life had been a life of miracles.